prefer. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Salem, president of the Middle East Institute. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here today. I'd also especially like to welcome our former president, Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain. Good to see you again. <laughs> uh, and we're really thrilled uh, to have this book talk today from one of our friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Dan Serwer. Uh, his uh, new book, From War to Peace, in the Balkans, the Middle East, and Ukraine. Uh, Dan reflects on the post-conflict scenarios of the Balkans and Ukraine in the 1990s, uh, explores what lessons uh, might be transferred or not from that experience there to the Middle East, uh, the role of the international community of the West as opposed to what's happening in the Middle East recently, the role of sectarianism, of ethnic divisions, uh, the challenges of peacekeeping and power sharing. How do, do the regional contexts differ between what was happening then in the Balkans and the Ukraine uh, recently as opposed to the Middle East? So uh, uh, today is an opportunity for us first to listen to his main sort of findings uh, uh, from the book and his reflections on how lessons might, have, might need to be learned. Um, and to engage in a discussion with him and with our colleague Renda Steam as well. I will introduce both at this point. Dan Serwer is an ex expert and a practitioner of peace and conflict resolution and has been for some time. He currently directs the Conflict Management uh, and American Foreign Policy Program next door at Johns Hopkins SIAS, School of Advanced International Studies. He's also a senior fellow here with us at the Middle East Institute, participates uh, in a lot of our research and uh, the track two dialogues that my colleague Renda Slim leads. Uh, formerly, Dan was a vice president uh, for Centers of Peace Building Inno and Innovation at the US Institute of Peace, was also a vice president for peace and stability at USIP where he led peace building work in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Sudan and in the Balkans. I served as an executive director of the Hamilton Baker Iraq Study Group. Uh, so he's worked uh, both as an expert and as a practitioner uh, in, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and brings an enormous amount of wealth, uh, wisdom, and expertise. Also joining us today as a discussant is our colleague and MEI senior fellow and the director of MEI's track Conflict Resolution and Track to Dialogues Initiative, Dr. Randa Slim, uh, Randa, welcome as well. Randa is also a non-resident fellow next door at Johns Hopkins SIAS Foreign Policy Institute. Formerly, she was a vice president of the International Institute for Sustained Dialogue. She's been a senior program advisor at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, guest scholar at the US Institute of Peace, program director at Resolve and program officer at the Kettering Foundation. She's uh, been a long-term practitioner of Track to Dialogue and with the Middle East Institute over the last five years has been running a number of dialogues that, involved, uh, that involve countries of the region, Arab countries, Turkey, Iran, and so on, as well as US-Russian Track to uh, Dialogues on the Middle East. Uh, this event today 
is being, I believe, uh, live streamed. Is that correct, Scott? And being recorded as well. Uh, so do silence your cell phones so that they uh, don't interfere with the broadcast. Uh, but uh, do tweet if you're inclined to do so. And if so, please use hashtag MEI Civil Wars. A bit of an ominous uh, hashtag, but uh, there it is. Um, with that, thanks again for coming. And uh, uh, join me in welcoming our good friend, Dan Serwer. Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. And thank you for honoring the book uh, with this event and with this very ample audience. Let me encourage those who are standing outside. There are a few seats down front here, especially on this side. There's one over here as well. You're welcome to come and take them. Uh, before I go too far, because I always forget at the end, uh, to tell people how to get this book, because you're not going to find it in bookstores. Uh, this is a modern book. Uh, uh, it, um, it's available for free on the internet, courtesy of my university, which paid for what's called open access, uh, uh, which is a way of guaranteeing the publisher a few bucks and then uh, making it available worldwide. Uh, it's also purchasable in hardcover, it's a pretty hard cover, uh, uh, from uh, Amazon, also downloadable from Amazon. So the first thing to explain about this book is its title, From War to Peace in the Balkans, Middle East, and Ukraine. People don't think of these places as in any way related. In fact, it's actually hard to find a map on which these three places uh, are all shown. But in practice, they are very close to each other. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, you do find, and I reproduce in the book, an Ottoman era map uh, of, of this sort. Uh, they're neighbors. They're neighbors, and they do share, uh, the relationship is not just geographical. They do share some, uh, some common history. The common history, above all, is in the Ottoman Empire, which was a patriarchal and exploitative empire, but did not make the efforts Western Europe indulged in to homogenize its populations. The result is a similar hodgepodge of what I would call non-nation states. That is, they are not all one thing or all something else. In the Balkans, it's all about Muslims, Serbs, Croats, and Albanians, not to mention the Macedonians, Vlachs, Turks, Ashkali, Jews, and others. In the Middle East, it's about Sunni, Shia, Kurds, Christians, not to mention the Jews, the Mandaeans, the Shabak, and others. The Russians and Soviets uh, also failed in rather vigorous efforts at times to extirpate Ukrainian identity. So what you have is uh, people identify as Ukrainian or Russian, both coexisting and, and, and sometimes quarreling with each other, especially in Crimea. This history has political implications for today. The concept of group rights, which exists both in the Balkans and the Middle East, is in part an Ottoman legacy. It's assigned to some sectarian and ethnic groups veto power over key issues and some measure of self-governance. The most important group right is the right to form the state and to claim privileges in it that, are, that others can't share. We see this very clearly today in Israel, where the Ottoman heritage is betrayed in the claim that the state is Jewish. Uh, we see it, the same kinds of claims being made in Turkey, by Arabs in Syria, by Kurds in Kurdistan. Uh, so, uh, 
there is a kind of commonality in current issues that arises from the fact that the borders were not drawn around homogenous populations. So the big question becomes who is included and who is excluded? Where rights are not attached to the group, but to individuals, there are fewer problems in my view, provided minorities receive equal protection. I wouldn't trade my equal protection in the United States for group rights in the United States for a moment. But that proviso, provided minorities receive equal protection, is hard to fulfill in places like the Balkans and the Middle East, where autocratic claims to do so are rarely fulfilled, and liberal democracies, and in particular, independent judiciaries are simply non-existent. Shia in Iraq did not believe Saddam Hussein's promises of equal treatment any more than Sunnis in Syria believe Assad's, or Arabs believe the analogous promises in Israel or in Iran. Even in relatively tolerant Iraqi and Syrian Kurdistan, not all minorities are convinced that they're treated equally. So what are the consequences of exclusion? Well, exclusion in weak states is known to lead to rebellion and challenges to borders, or both. And that's what we actually saw with the insurgency of the Islamic State which sought to erase the border between Iraq and Syria. In fact, there's a vast academic literature on this subject that suggests that uh, states that exclude part of their population from political power and economic benefits or social privilege tend to fail. And that's the point of Asimoglu and Robinson's work and I think amply demonstrated in many, by many other people as well. So a good deal of what we've seen in the Middle East in recent years fits this pattern. Certainly Assad's Syria, Saddam's and Maliki's Iraq, Saleh and Hadi's Yemen, and Gaddafi's Libya. We're seeing exclusion create rebellion and challenges to borders. And that's exactly what we saw in the Balkans as well. So what are my conclusions from this? I'm going to skip over describing the Balkans in any detail. I'm assuming this audience isn't much interested in the Balkans. The first conclusion, and I think it's, it's the one that distinguishes the Middle East most from the Balkans, is that teleology matters. You need to know where you're going in order to get there. The Balkans has had a preferred direction, not from the early 1990s, because in the early 1990s when the wars were occurring, uh, nobody had decided yet that the Balkans belonged in the EU. Nobody had made a promise that they would end up there. That promise was made around 2000, 2001. And though there are challenges to it, and a lot of people don't believe it today, the fact is that all the countries of the Balkans have as a primary national goal entering NATO or the EU or both. And in order to do that, you have to fulfill certain conditions, and they know they have to fulfill those conditions. The Middle East entirely lacks this teleological drive. It's not at all clear if there's any goal that is common to the countries of the Middle East. It has only one example of a transition in progress to something resembling uh, liberal democracy, uh, and that's Tunisia which is too fragile and far from the center of gravity and too small to drag anyone else in its wake. 
Sometimes people cite Israel as well because Israel, after all, is a parliamentary democracy. Uh, but it is, in fact, a place where the leadership is now uh, behaving as if it's not a parliamentary democracy of the liberal sort. It has one advantage over all the rest of the Middle East uh, that's very important in my view, which is the independent judiciary. But that, even that is now being challenged. Let me add that uh, not only does the Middle East not have a preferred direction, but it has a conflict, the GCC conflict, between Riyadh and Doha, essentially, though, of course, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Cairo, and Manama are also involved. Uh, the GCC conflict uh, complicates things throughout the Middle East because the Qataris, the Saudis, and the Emiratis prefer war on someone else's territory. I've been recently in Riyadh and Doha uh, with, a, with a class of students uh, studying the conflict, and I was particularly struck by the repeated assertions on both sides that, uh, that physical attacks have occurred, but they don't occur inside uh, Saudi Arabia or Qatar, which are quite peaceful, they occur in Yemen, they occur in Libya, they occur elsewhere. How many of these allegations are true and how many are false uh, is hard to tell, to tell you the truth. But at least some of them uh, have some basis. Let me go over the, the, in addition to the teleology, what are some of the other lessons learned in the Balkans? Certainly that inclusive leadership is key to starting, preventing, and ending wars. Milosevic and Tujman in the Balkans set a pattern also seen in Syria, Yemen, and Libya. What's that pattern? That pattern is favoring one group uh, over other groups in the society. So in the Balkans, it was Tujman favoring Croats, Roman Catholics for, in, in shorthand. Uh, it was uh, Milosevic favoring Serbs, but uh, in Syria, uh, it's Assad favoring whoever will support him. It's not entirely on an ethnic basis. In Yemen, uh, it, it was uh, Saleh uh, and the exclusion of the Houthis, but also Hadi and uh, giving the Houthis the feeling that they were going to be excluded in Libya. Just about everybody was excluded and, uh, uh, by Gaddafi. So what do you do about it? In my way of thinking, the Balkans do demonstrate that early prevention with adequate resources can work. And the place where that's been done repeatedly in the Balkans is Macedonia, where uh, war has been prevented. I, depends how you count, but I would say three or four times uh, by uh, international early prevention efforts. Now, it's not that nobody has tried in the Middle East. They have tried. They tried in Yemen. GCC tried. The UN and Arab League tried in Syria. But the resources were woefully inadequate. Now, if you read uh, Barbara Walters, she'll tell you that What's really needed, and I'm sympathetic with this perspective, is uh, even during the negotiations to be able to guarantee that if I agree to stop fighting, that the other guys won't get an advantage. And guaranteeing that in the Middle East, in Syria, for example, would have required a major international military deployment. No question about it. And that has never been available in Syria. I know uh, lots of people wanted international intervention in Syria. I, I do believe that had it happened very early in the game during the peaceful uh, protests uh, of the first period, uh, it might have been successful. But once things went in the military direction, 
I don't think the resources were ever seriously available for Syria. I don't think ethnic partition works. It's been proposed in the Balkans many, many times. Uh, it's right now on the table in the Balkans uh, to partition Kosovo, basically, a swap between land occupied by Serbs and Albanians between Kosovo and Serbia. It's been on the table in, in the Middle East uh, many times, most recently with the independence referendum in Kurdistan. I think partition has a particularly bad history. Uh, and uh, even the academic literature that treats partition, uh, the, the only way you can give it a good, uh, a good gloss is by ignoring uh, what happened in India, Pakistan, and what happened in Israel and Palestine. Uh, in Kurdistan, I, I, I go into some detail on Kurd Kurdistan in the book because it, it really merits some attention because the Kurds have a claim, a rightful claim in my opinion, to wanting independence. Why? Because they were mistreated by Saddam, because they were chased out of their own country into the mountains in Turkey, because they uh, have governed themselves fairly well now for decades, uh, because they speak a separate language, because they can, they certainly when time could claim to run a more tolerant society than the rest of Iraq. There are lots of valid claims by Kurdistan. But what did Kurdistan lack? Why uh, was it so unsuccessful? Well, it was unsuccessful because of a military intervention from Baghdad, but that military intervention betrayed the weaknesses that, that Kurdistan had, and the weaknesses were geopolitical. It had no approval by its neighbors, Turkey, Iran, Baghdad, Syria, just hadn't, and that approval was, was uh, what helped with something like Montenegro or Kosovo, for example. Uh, it didn't have a defined border. And when borders are not agreed, the way they're settled is by force. So that's what happened. Uh, uh, but I don't think it's wise to deny that the Kurds have good reason to seek independence and good reason to uh, claim that they have been excluded uh, in some respects inside Iraq. International contributions can really be very important. I don't think they're necessarily determinative, but uh, it, it, certainly in the Balkans, the American intervention in Bosnia, uh, NATO intervention in Bosnia led by the Americans, and then in Kosovo, these were decisive moments. But note that they were decisive moments because they were sustained. They weren't sporadic, they weren't pinpricks, they weren't a single cruise missile raid on a single chemical weapons depot. US never cared enough about Syria to intervene in a serious way. But Russia, Turkey, and Iran have shown that they do. They, they, they did have interests enough to, to intervene in a serious way, and it's been decisive. The Americans also opted not to intervene in Libya, but the UAE did, and it's starting to look as if that might be decisive UAE and Egypt, I would say, did, and it looks like that might be decisive. Neighborhood counts. Who your neighbors are is just terrifically important because they have interests, and they're more willing to act on those interests. Certainly, we've seen the importance of uh, neighborhood in Syria, Iraq, or Yemen, in the kingdom, Libya and Egypt, uh, 
uh, very few of these civil wars could occur except for the engagement one way or another of neighbors. Not enough has been written about decentralization. There's a lot of literature on power sharing. And the academics will tell you that it's a pretty good idea after civil wars. I'm doubtful, and I think there's some evidence uh, against it. Uh, the evidence isn't decisively against it, but it raises enough questions that uh, it's worth looking at other possibilities. I'm talking about power sharing at the national level. Decentralization is a way of sharing power by empowering provinces, localities. And I think it's a better pattern. It's certainly proved very useful in the Balkans. Everywhere in the Balkans, it's proved vital to ending wars. And uh, when you look at uh, Libya and Iraq in particular, uh, I think it's hard to conceive of solutions that don't involve uh, the decentralization of power to Cyrenaica and Tripolitania, for example, in, in Libya, in, uh, in Iraq to the provinces and to Kurdistan. So what are the prospects in the Middle East? Uh, not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. <laughs> Peace agreements in the Balkans were always between two contenders. Where they were not, as in Bosnia, we reduced them to two contenders. We made a federation between the Croats and Muslims, dragged them to, to Dayton, and made peace between the federation and, and Republika Srpska. Ukraine is bipolar. And it's only political will, I think, that stops the Minsk II agreement which notably includes a great deal of decentralization. Middle East conflicts are often multipolar. In Syria, it's hard to count how many sides there are, because there are a lot of different wars happening, and I get up to five or six without too much trouble. I know no diplomats who can negotiate simultaneously Five, with five or six different sides. And the GCC split really does complicate everything. It really does complicate everything. So it's the region, like it or not, while all, it's often discounted as too hard, not going to happen. It's hard to picture the restoration of stability in the Middle East without some sort of regional compact. America's effort to polarize the region between Arabs and Iran is not, in my view, in the interests of either. But MEI's Middle East dialogue has, in fact, enunciated some principles that, serve, that could serve as the foundation, the first of which, interestingly, is respect for territorial integrity. People from all over, the Balk uh, all over the Middle East agree about this. They do not want to change borders. And you can talk about how the Sykes-Picot border is artificial all you like. It's not artificial after 100 years. It's been there a long time. It's not the Sykes-Picot border. It's the San Remo border. But the point is that no one wants to change it. Other principles suggested by the Middle East dialogue include individual rights, inclusion, diversity. I might have liked something in there about decentralization, but I don't think it happened. The Middle East is the only major region of the world where there's no overarching uh, security framework. Uh, so where do you start for a security framework of that sort? Colleagues uh, in the Middle East dialogue uh, have suggested that it start with threat perceptions because they definitely differ. Iran views its presence in Lebanon and Syria as countering threats, but Arab Sunni states see it as a threat to them. 
that's a difference in threat perception worth exploring. Another place to start is where interests overlap. I think uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, after many years, are finally discovering that a stable Iraq might be a good idea. Uh, might not be so bad to have that buffer between them. And they're both uh, moving in that direction. A third place to start is where common interests are obvious. Global warming, the youth bulge, water shortages, all common throughout the Middle East. A fourth place to start, this is sort of my gig, uh, is with indigenous conflict management mechanisms, including both tribal practices common throughout the Middle East and the practices surrounding the various pilgrimages because Middle Eastern countries do in fact resolve some very difficult conflicts, usually about once a year in advance of the pilgrimages. My bottom lines, the US has been trying to decrease its presence in the Middle East for at least a decade. I'm the only person associated with the Middle East Institute, I think, who approves of this. I think we are too much exposed in the Middle East. But that effort to withdraw has failed because doing so leaves vacuums that have been filled by malevolent forces. What it will take to withdraw without those malevolent forces taking over is better diplomacy. It's not more drones or cruise missiles. We've tried that. It isn't working. We need to refocus, it seems to me, not on the individual states so much as on regional stability, which requires better leadership, more attention to conflict prevention, positive neighborhood engagement, and decentralization of power. It does not require redrawing borders to accommodate ethnic differences. Those, in my view, are the main lessons I would draw from the Balkans to apply to the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Really, that was a fascinating, brilliant, insightful, a lot of excellent points and parallels and differences and lessons. Uh, a lot to talk about, and, but let's start directly with our discussant, uh, Dr. Renda Sleem, for her comments, queries, quibbles. Renda, right. the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, for your kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with both Paul and Dan. Uh, let me first congratulate Dan on an excellent, insightful, very time, you know, and timely book. It's here. I read it over the weekend. It's a quite an interesting read. I, you know, Dan earlier in his remark referred to that people, you know, people wonder how he can bring the Middle East, the Balkans, and the Ukraine. I'm one of those. So a while ago, when he told me that he's writing a book about the three. I remember saying to myself, okay, let's see how he's going to pull this together. And so, well, he did, and congratulations. Uh, the Middle East definitely is in need of major lessons learned from other regions. Definitely there are different conflict dynamics between the Middle East, even within the Middle East, between different conflicts in the region, between the Ukraine and the Middle East, the Balkan and the Middle East. Yet there are lessons to be learned. Uh, if we look, if we do a tour d'horizon of the region right now, um, between 2013 and 2017, the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, alone accounted for 68% of the global battle-related death. Yemen is facing a famine. 80% of Yemenis are in need of humanitarian assistance. Syria, 5.6 million refugees, 6 million IDPs, and the, Syria is, and the conflict is not yet over. It lost four times. The losses to its GDP are four times to the, its 2010 GDPs. Libya, Dan talked about the ongoing escalation, and we are going to see even more violence going forward there. Uh, Iraq, Iraq until recently, and still, in my opinion, still the positive story in, in the region, yet we are seeing ISIS regrouping, we are seeing you know, 
anywhere from six to 10 deaths a day at the hand of ISIS deeper cells in different parts of Iraq. So that story is not over yet. And as I said, there is not yet a light at the end of the tunnel. So hence the importance of looking at other regions that have moved from war to peace, like the Balkans, and what are the lessons for the Middle East. And this book is providing us some important lessons. I would like to make three points. I'm recently on a three-point kick. You know, everywhere I go, I have to make three points. I'm heading from here to a World Bank panel. I have three points to make. So <laughs> anyway, so let me make three points in response or in com commenting on uh, the book and Dan's remark. And each of these points will, uh, I will be asking questions that hopefully Dan can answer in helping us unpack more of what the book really says about lessons. The first point uh, relates to peace building and sustaining peace. Um, traditionally, peace building and sustaining peace has been approached as an afterthought by international security and development aid organizations like the UN and the World Bank. It's an area that has been often underprioritized and underfunded. The focus always has been on how we move from war to peace through peacemaking, mostly mediated negotiation, and then how we enforce peace through peacekeeping as well as what other financial incentives to sweeten the deal for combatants. Yet we know from research that 25% of all peace agreement relapse into violence within five years, leading to some, to more and intense cycles of violence and eventually to protraction of the conflict. So sustaining the peace needs to be part of the planning of any intervention to end wars from the get-go. So in this respect, I have two-part question for you uh, in terms of the Balkans, but also their implication for the MENA region. The first part is whether and how international actors involved in ending the conflicts in the Balkans approached peace building and sustaining peace. And the second part is how do the governments in the Balkans approach the subject of peace? If you look at other countries that have gone, you know, that have moved from war to peace in their peace building, you see governments making peace itself as a policy priority. Ghana, Guinea, Costa Rica, uh, Kenya, Costa Rica, uh, Colombia. So, uh, so how, I mean, what, where does peace as a policy, you know, fit today with the Balkan governments? Um, um, and, and, so, and what does that mean uh, for the Middle East? We can discuss that. The second point you make is about power sharing. I get your point that, you know, there's too much emphasis on power sharing, not enough on decentralization. Yet, I think many of these raging conflicts in the Middle East today, any settlement, political settlement in the future, in any one of them will have to involve some kind of power sharing and decentralization. I do not see it either or. It has to have power sharing at the national level as well as decentralization at the local, regional, and at, you know, levels. Now, you mention in the book um, that when you talk about power sharing, you talk about Iraq, you talk about Tunisia, Morocco, and I have to admit I was very personally offended by the fact you did not mention Lebanon. The <laughs> oldest power sharing arrangement in the Middle East is in Lebanon. It How dates, would I dare mention <laughs> Lebanon? <laughs> it, dates <laughs> it dates back to 1861. It is the Reglement Organique, or Organic Law, which was introduced by the Ottomans when, at the time, Lebanon was Mount Lebanon. And after a civil war that pitted Druze warlord land roads against peasants, Maronite peasants, mostly Maronite peasants, the Ottomans, along with a consortium of five European powers, including France, UK, Prussia, Russia, and I'm forgetting what, Austria, introduced this Reglement Organique, which basically recognized the religious communities of Mount Lebanon, the six principal ones, three Christian, three Muslims, as, as being political actors and imposed or introduced and ad imposed an administrative council. Each of these religious communities had two, two representatives on the administrative council, and the council was run by a non-Arab, Ottoman religion, uh, Christian 
uh, Greek Catholic, in fact, governor. And Lebanon has been, since then, experimenting with the same kind of power sharing based on confessional lines. Now, again, it's not always a successful experiment, and it has not always moved, especially in terms of changing or amending these power sharing have moved um, without violence, but still, it is there, and it's something that also to talk about. What I want to say is that about, about power sharing in Lebanon is that there has been a study trying to compare the different forms of power sharing arrangement or link the different form of power sharing arrangement in Lebanon or iteration of that old Reglement Organique, and there have been five of them over, since uh, 1861, to domestic peace. And one of the conclusion, and that's, I have to refer to the author, Marie-Joël Zahar, in a book edited by two Canadian authors, I have their names, but somewhere, and, but Marie-Joëlle Zahar was interested in looking at these five iteration of power sharing in Lebanon and basically trying to draw lessons, how do they link to domestic peace? And one of the conclusion that she made in, in her chapter is that external factors more than domestic dynamics are paramount in explaining the varying degrees to which power sharing arrangement have succeeded at maintaining peace in Lebanon. So when a foreign protector, and often it's either multiple or single protector, better multiple protector, a multiple condominium, is there, the likelihood of violence abates. I mean, power sharing works. When one of these protectors starts weakening and withdrawing, then the likelihood of violence increases, and you have instability until there is a new preeminent protector of the power sharing arrangement. Usually it is regional or outside. So the question to the Balkans, so what can we say about the relationship between power sharing and domestic peace in the Balkans? You talked about different countries in the Balkans reaching, doing power sharing in different ways. Bosnia, it's more rigid, established at Dayton, making governance a little bit more difficult, whereas the others came at it a little bit more organically, and I'm assuming better at dealing with it. So in that respect, what can we say about power sharing and domestic peace in the Balkans? And what does that imp imply for the Middle East going forward? We can discuss that. And finally, the last point, I said three points. The last, third, but most important point is something that you referred to in your presentation, which is inclusivity. You know, research abounds that inclusive peacemaking processes, especially in terms of including women, including youth, including private sector, civil society, make are key to sustaining peace, to enduring stability. And yet, in discussing how this evolved, peacemaking or how, how the, the peacemaking process evolved in uh, the Balkans, you talk, and I'm going to quote, because it's really a, a great quote, I th he, you said, the post-power transitions, but you are referring earlier about peacemaking, but eventually later also about peace building. The post-war uh, post transitions were managed almost entirely by men without high-level purges, people-to-people -people reconciliation efforts, and sustain dialogue between and, between and within civil society." End of quote. Yet again, we all know that all of this, inclusivity of women, youth, people-to-people -people dialogues, reconciliations, are important to sustaining peace. So retroactively, if these were to be included or were included in the peacemaking efforts in, Bos in, in the Balkans, in the peace-building efforts in the Balkans, how, how the situation would look like today in the Balkans? How does stability, how does, you know, how to say, how do politics look today in the Balkans? I will stop here. Thank you, Renda. Thank you for those three excellent points. Uh, and uh, we'll have responses from uh, Dr. Serwer. I then have a few questions of my own, and then we'll turn to questions and comments from the audience. So Dan, responses to Ms. Dr. Sleem. Well, I mean it when I say, how, how would I dare comment about Lebanon? There are some, some magnificent there. experts on Lebanon in, in surrounding me. Lebanon is always in need of help. So. Um, <laughs> Randa, I, I actually see some important relationships among your three questions. I think they're directly related. Uh, 
One of the reasons I'm very doubtful about power sharing is because I've seen how it worked in the Balkans. It worked to prevent inclusivity. It worked to maintain the power of warring parties. The people who wanted peace right through the war in Bosnia were completely excluded from power at the end mm. of the war. And in fact, there's been only one nominally non-ethnic prime minister uh, since the war. And even he was, in fact, the head of the Bosniak party. And he gained power mainly with support from the internationals. So uh, power sharing, while it pretends to be inclusive, is very often, in practice, exclusive and prevents evolution of the of, of the political system to a more liberal democratic regime. Uh, so there's a, there's a nice paper by, a, I think she's a Norwegian scholar named Anna Knudsen. She looks at, you know, in one of these quantitative uh, studies, she looks at whether power sharing in sub-Saharan Africa leads to better outcomes in terms of peace and democracy. And she finds the answer is no. It does not. Now, that's the only sub-Saharan Africa. Circumstances, context matters. Yes. Circumstances differ elsewhere. But she also shows something else that I regard as very interesting. That more peaceful democratic outcomes are associated with renegotiations of peace agreements, including power sharing and peace agreements. Now, this is very interesting to a diplomat because when a diplomat hears that an agreement has to be renegotiated, yes. that spells failure. Exactly. That's failure. And what she shows is it's not failure at all. It's a signal that the parties have matured enough and are co willing to compromise enough to talk to each other enough to renegotiate their agreement. So my real objection is the kind of rigid power sharing that we have in Bosnia, which is a kind of uh, ethnically coded uh, uh, power sharing from the presidency down to the street sweepers. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, it is much softer in other places, in Kosovo and in Macedonia in particular. And I think it works better there. Though in Macedonia, one of the real bits of progress was uh, uh, decentralization to the municipal level. When I first went there uh, in the early 2000s, uh, I met with mayors who said, look, I, I haven't got a dime. I can't do a damn thing. I can't repave a road. Hmm. Uh, today, that's completely changed. They have their own sources of income, hmm. and, uh, and it's made an enormous difference. In Bosnia, direct election of mayors was one of the really important things that uh, was arranged about 10 years after the war and has had a positive effect, though it's not enough to overcome this, this very rigid, uh, this very rigid uh, ethnic hierarchy that exists. Why, do, why is it so important to decentralize? Well, first of all, there are some parts of a country where a minority will be a majority in, 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 a, in a particular municipality, province, whatever it is. But secondly, politics at the municipal level is, it's hard to make it about ethnicity. It's about filling the potholes. It's about opening the schools. It's about delivering health care. And so you get much more issues-based uh, politics at, at the local level. Uh, there's been precious little, I mean, there have been efforts. There are lots of projects all over the Balkans. Uh, for peace building dialogue between communities. Uh, you know, I think some of that stuff has worked quite well, but it hasn't had a macro impact. So that many of the uh, driving factors of the wartime period are still very present in the Balkans, and it's very visible to anybody who goes there. It's peaceful. It's safe. It's, people get along perfectly well in the street every day. 
but when it comes to politics, it's still driven by the same ethnic territoriality that, that, uh, that uh, drove the wartime can I, can situation. I say, can I interrupt here? Please. Please. You said that some advisors of the Trump administration are now advising Balkan leaders? They are. And who is, are you referring to? In I don't remember all the names, so what's his Paul name? Manafort? Bannon? But, no, Bannon? no, Bannon has been there. Yeah. Uh, I'm starting it, to get worried about the Balkans. So. Well, <laughs> th 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 that's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that is unsettling in the Balkans today and should be unsettling in the Middle East and in Ukraine is that the United States has an ethnic nationalist administration. I don't think there's any doubt about this any longer. It's a... Uh, uh, I would call it a white supremacist administration. Uh, others will call it other things, but uh, it, it is an, it, it believes in, in ethnic identity as fundamental uh, to uh, the identity of the United States and of Americans, which is very exclusive vis-a-vis -vis me because I'm not, I didn't grow up as one of the majority in the United States, even if today Jews are regarded as part of the majority. That wasn't true. 50 years ago, we were part of the minority. And uh, uh, I've, I've never grown out of that, let's put it that way. Um, so uh, Kosovo, Serbia, to give you an example, there's never been a program of exchange of visits across the Kosovo-Serbia border, as there was between France and Germany after World War II, which had a tremendously positive impact. Uh, in the Middle East, I think we also don't see that kind of Saudi -Iranian effort. Yeah. Uh, the Saudis and the Iranian, I mean, the Qataris and the Saudis, the Correct. current leadership of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, according to my informants, don't know each other at all. Yeah. And it's appalling. It's appalling. And that's one of the many things that some sort of overarching security framework would, would fix. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I also found the book extremely fascinating and raised so many interesting parallels and, and questions and points. And I want to just pose a few comments or questions to you, Dan, and if you know, care to comment or some on some or all or whatever. And some sort of statements that uh, struck me, you say at one point uh, that some people you were you know, talking with said it was better under Tito. Mm. And that really struck me because, I mean, obviously if you look at Iraq, a lot of people say things were better under Saddam, things were better under Gaddafi, okay. and many things indeed were. And that affects the narrative uh, of what is going on historically in these countries. Uh, is it regression or is it progress or is it some elements of both? When I look at Iraq today, and maybe I echo a little bit what Renda said, you know, with all the devastation and mistakes and all of that, there is a form of progress there in attempting to hammer out, you know, some form of governance and coexistence and all of that, that it's historically necessary and possibly going in a progressive, you know, overall direction, but others look at it as just, you know, utterly, de you know, regressive, negative, and so on. I was wondering, you know, given that that same question is coming up in the Balkans, how do they see it? A second big takeaway for me was that, and you make this point in a sense, the international community can do this. They can often prevent the war from taking place. They can often stop the civil war cold or f from continuing, and they can, through intensive civilian and political action, help end wars and do state building. Now it's difficult, it's not perfect and so on, but it is possible. And that again links to a narrative towards the recent Middle East, particularly under the Obama administration, where the argument was, the reality was there was no will the argument was it's too complicated and it never works out and it can't be done. And making the point that it can be done, I think is very important. Third thing that struck me uh, uh, is that personalities matter. Uh, 
that whereas you're looking at all these systemic things and drivers and regional order and all of that, the, what Mr. Milosevic decided to do and what Mr. Assad decides to do and what Mr. Maliki decides to do is critical to history. And so how do you measure the impact of the person and how much is systemic and sort of broad forces? I was struck also very much with the parallels in the security dilemma, that when the Serbs do something to what they see as protecting themselves, like the Iranians have an army in Lebanon to protect themselves, well, obviously that becomes a problem for somebody else, and everybody becomes intertwined in what you call a security dilemma or a conflict trap. And that, you know, that important parallel is that and you ended with that in your remarks, that to end civil wars, you have to first fix the regional systemic problem. That the, the, a lot of these civil wars are symptoms, and certainly working towards regional de-escalation, regional order is a very, very important thing. On the issue of bipolar societies and power sharing and all of that, it's interesting that in the literature on consociational democracy, political science, and power sharing and governing plural societies. Uh, the argument made there through their research, like Aaron Leipart and others, is actually bipolar is much more difficult than multipolar. Uh, now I get the arguments on both sides, but that in that literature, uh, bipolar is seen as the most difficult because there's an obvious you know, majority and minority, winner and loser, so why should I share power? I'm the majority. And it, sort of comes up in the Iraqi case Correct. that Iraq is half majority minority Correct. and half tri, yes. tripolar. Yes. And the tripolar works better than the bipolar yeah. for the Iraqi case. And Lebanon was lucky in a way, and is lucky today that it's not the old bipolar Muslim Christian, it's actually tripolar, Sunni okay. Shias and Christians. And there's no, there's no winner, nobody can take it all, so you have to share power. In the power sharing question, I agree absolutely, decentralization is, is actually a form of power sharing. And, and I think the issue of power sharing uh, is exceedingly complex. Uh, and there are a number of issues that are raised by it. One is, to my mind, at the ends of civil wars, there has to be some measure of power sharing, simply because the groups often wouldn't accept anything else, so there's a reality to it. Uh, uh, but that the, uh, uh, the, the system, there are two questions. One is, how, who is sharing power? Exactly. I mean, when you said power sharing is it's, it's exclusive, it's because it's, oh, it's power sharing among corrupt warlords who exclude young people or women or civil mm -hmm. society. So the problem there is not power sharing, it's who is sharing the power. Uh, a second point about power sharing is, it, is can it evolve? Like you say, can it be renegotiated? Yes, maybe in a, right at the end of the war you have to have a certain type of power sharing, but 10 years and 20 years down the road, what's the mechanism for evolution of the political system in general? A third thing I think that is often ignored by warring parties uh, is that in a civil war, power just having the gun, the power of the gun, gun, guarantees everything else. Guarantees your economy, your security, your rights, all of that. And often, at the end of a civil war, you want to, those warlords, or the warlords want to be in there to guarantee all of those things. Whereas, as you sort of mentioned, most of those things can be guaranteed outside of who's governing. Through a strong judiciary, which is absolutely essential, obviously through decentralization, through changes into the Constitution, as long as the Constitution is really impactful and protected by a judiciary, such that what communities and individuals need doesn't have to be assured by the minister, but is assured by the system. And once the system is safe, it doesn't matter that much who's the prime minister. Correct. But if you don't have a system, Correct. it's gonna matter a lot who is the prime minister. I wanted to comment from you that in the Arab, recent Arab world, the conditions were largely ones of political revolution. 
uh, you know, Syria was that, Yemen was that, Libya was that, Algeria is that, today Sudan is that, today Egypt was that, Bahrain was that. Yes, there was a regional dimension that came in into it, whereas the Balkans was sort of collapse of the Soviet Union, it was a bit different. So to what degree do you see that difference where the Middle East really was largely a revolution for domestic political general rights and wasn't really a sectarian war to start with? How does that make that different? And I want to end with one comment, and again, maybe echoing Grenda a bit, that the three experiments of power sharing, semi-democratic, constitutional systems in the Middle East are Tunisia, Iraq, and Lebanon. And they all have tremendous problems. Uh, and they're interesting experiments in Morocco and a kind of a semi-constitutional monarchy. So we shouldn't lose sight that it's, there are several experiments. And Iraq, because it's the biggest and the richest and the most central and has Sunnis and Shias and is the middle of the region, that's the most important experiment and its success and failure is critically important. Uh, brilliant book, I, I loved it, great presentation. Some comments, if you want to comment on some of them, then we'll turn it over to the audience. Well, thank you very much, that's really, I, I feel gratified that I've excited such questions. Fascinating uh, uh, on Iraq, I agree. W when I was writing this book, uh, it wasn't as clear the direction Iraq mm -hmm. uh, has taken since, uh, since I finished. I, I do think Iraq is an interesting example these days of an evolution. Uh, when we were there all together, uh, it's more than, it's a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. more or less now, what we found was that all of the political parties were looking for cross-sectarian alliances because they'd understood that that's what the electorate wanted and that was the way to win elections. So uh, that was a very good evolution, but it wasn't obvious uh, mm -hmm. until after I had finished uh, the book. Uh, people thinking things were better before. I'm going to offend. They're not better. They're just not. You look at the numbers, they're not. They're not better under Saddam. They weren't better under Tito. They weren't better in the Soviet Union. It's nonsense. Why do people say these things? That's the question you have to ask. And they say these things because they're terribly disappointed. Because the numbers speak to income, they speak to GNP, they speak to all sorts of things, except what people really care about, which is safety and security, education, health, uh, lots of other things that, that, that don't get captured in the numbers. So, uh, I hear it all the time in the Balkans. Uh, some of my best Balkan friends insist that I'm full of it, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that things are really, were really better under Tito. I don't believe it. Uh, uh, on the question of personalities matter. They do matter, but it's important to reflect on how they matter. Uh, and they matter, it seems to me, in the Balkans because Tuchman and Milosevic, Milosevic were able to harness ethnic national sentiments that were dominant in their ethnic groups after the, after the fall of communism. Uh, it was that matchup of leadership with sentiment that was mm -hmm. That, that was so dangerous to the, to the states of the Balkans. Um, I think, you know, they were populous in our current terminology and they were very successful at it. Uh, there are other situations where personalities matter because, not because they harness popular support, but because they are able to wield military power. and police power. And that was, uh, I don't think Saddam was very popular. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't think Brezhnev was very popular. They, they, they harnessed uh, real power, hard power. Uh, security dilemmas every place. I mean, everybody, nobody who commits atrocities 
does it without thinking that atrocities have been committed against them. That's my rule of thumb. I want to know, OK, you committed this atrocity. What was it that was done to you that you thought justified this? Because people do justify atrocities. And they justify it by claiming to be victims of atrocities. Uh, on the bipolar versus multipolar question, my assertion was not meant to apply to uh, the consociationalism itself, because after all, in Bosnia, that's tripartite. It was meant to apply to the diplomatic negotiations. Diplomatic negotiations are very, very complicated. And to do them between more than two sides is extraordinarily difficult. So when I called Bob Fraser during the initiative that led to Dayton, uh, there was a peace plan, Tony Lake's peace plan. And uh, I was still going around working on the Croat Muslim Federation in Bosnia. And I called Bob Fraser and I said, Bob, uh, if, if my federation isn't part of the peace plan, tell me so I can stop selling it. And he said, no, no, we, we have to have a two-party problem at the negotiations. And that's what we got, more or less. Uh, three parties is very, very difficult. Five, six parties, as in Syria, I think is actually impossible. So I don't think this, I don't. It could be broken, broken into components. Right? It could be broken into components. Um, and that's what the Russians have succeeded exactly. in doing. Uh, you know, uh, they haven't really settled anything. They've just, uh, they've arranged the surrenders, basically. Uh, can power sharing evolve? It depends on where you put the power sharing. I mean, there's lots of power sharing that isn't institutionalized in the Constitution. And if you, if you have that kind of softer power sharing, it's much easier for it to, to evolve. But you know we have power sharing in the American Constitution. Sure. Between small states and large states, there was a great compromise. And that great compromise uh, is a power sharing arrangement. And frankly, it has outlived its usefulness. It's the reason why the Electoral College is selecting presidents who don't have the popular vote. And that's not sustainable, in my, in my view. And it's also not amendable. You cannot change it. So American democracy faces a crisis over its own power sharing arrangement. Uh, revolution versus sectarian war. Uh, a lot of the people involved in sectarian war think of it as revolution, actually. But I think there is a difference. Uh, and uh, I have to think, Paul, about about how that's affected the situation, how that's, has that made the situation in the Middle East somehow different uh, from the situation in the Balkans. But I must say the Middle East conflicts have tended to do what the Balkan conflicts did, which was to degenerate to become, into yeah, yeah, ethnic yeah. Ex sectarian war because of the security dilemmas involved. People retreat to their, whatever their primary identity is when they're threatened with death. And uh, it's just a human characteristic that is quite understandable. So let me end there, but, but, but thank both of you for an extraordinary set of questions. Thank, it's no, very thank gratifying you, to realize that I've, that, that I've uh, generated Triggered. those. Thank you a lot, Dan. We have 20 minutes for uh, audience questions answer, raise your hand. Microphones, I think, will get to you. Let's try the gentleman in the second <coughs> row. State your name and a short question or comment. Uh, there you go. And thank I'm you. Peter Humphrey, intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, you condemn uh, ethnic division as a way to get peaceful borders. And then you cite the example of India and Pakistan, which was not an ethnic division. And then you ignored the successful ethnic divisions of the Czechs, the Slovaks, East Timorese, most of the Soviet republics. I'm not sure you, you, you've made the case that your d data set uh, points to failure. And, and so I want to ask, when have we actually ever tried 
or uh, more importantly, allowed ethnic division. Uh, because that's the way you run the experiment, to see if it works or not. Thank you. Dan, can you take note of some of the questions? I'm going to take three or four questions. Hans, uh, gentleman in that second row. Um, uh, Jeremiah Rosman, National Security Analyst at Association of the U.S. Army and a PhD candidate in the University of Virginia. Um, I also have a question that kind of goes along with the division and with partition. Um, you said that the Sykes-Picot borders are generally accepted and uh, I, I want to know where you uh, got that statement from. I, it's not that I doubt it or anything, but it seems like there are a number of conflicts that uh, do desire um, changed borders, the rise of ISIS, the Iranian Revolution, um, the Israel-Palestine conflict, for example, and then the uh, referendum with the Kurds. Uh, so just wondering about Great. that. Thank you. There was a hand in the back, gentleman way in the back. I'll try to get to everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this, Dan. Uh, I'm Howard Sumk. I spent the last 12 years of my USAID career as the director of the missions in Albania, Bosnia, and West Bank, Gaza. Um, over that time, we probably spent in aggregate a couple of billion dollars on economic development, humanitarian assistance, and other kinds of aid that was always couched in terms of being part of the confidence building and peace building process. And I wonder how you see that in the framework you've talked about here, because I, I don't think I heard you mention that, that aspect of, of peace building at all there. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. You want to take those three? In a for, with conciseness, and then we'll take some I'll more try, questions. I'll try, I'll try. Uh, uh, my point, uh, I, I, I take the criticism, my point is really about borders, not about ethnic division. Borders, when they're agreed, you can divide peacefully. When they're not agreed, you can't. There's always somebody on the wrong side of the line. And people will ethnically cleanse and fight over where to draw that line. There is always somebody on the wrong side of the line. I don't know any place on earth where there's a serious dispute where, where there isn't somebody on the wrong side of the line. Uh, the wrong side of the line being the line that his ethnic group uh, uh, doesn't dominate. Uh, so the, the point is really about agreement about borders. And that, that's where Kurdistan failed miserably. They hadn't had any agreement on the borders yet. Uh, just to give you one more example, uh, the current proposal in the Balkans is, is to uh, swap ethnically dominated Serbs, Serb and Albanian areas. There will still be people on the wrong side of the line. And they have not been able to come to an agreement. So first, I know when borders are disputed, there are disputes. There are no disputes between Iraq and Syria over the border that I know of. Anybody no. want to correct me? Mm -hmm. There are 80 outstanding border disputes in Asia today, many of them involving China. You know when there are disputes because governments dispute. Uh, I have actually never met anyone who's disputed the Iraq-Syria border, which is completely artificial, I agree. It's completely artificial, but that doesn't mean people, that doesn't mean people don't accept it. Islamic State disputed it. That's absolutely correct. I'm not sympathetic with that. It seems like they had a powerful recruiting force for a while ago in the Middle East. Sure, sure, sure. You know, that there, that there are people that dispute borders, I don't doubt that there are governments that dispute borders, I do doubt, because in the Middle East, except for the Iran-Iraq border, over which they fought a war, of course, there aren't many disputes over borders. Uh, 
there's no dispute in the Golan Heights. There's a territorial annexation, but there's no real dispute. Uh, everybody knows whom Golan belongs to. It's not a confusion. Uh, there were other questions about the U.S. aid and the money spent. Uh, U.S. aid and money spent. Uh, what has been in this impact? Look, its impact has been very good when it comes to economic growth, to creating jobs, to doing all sorts of things. I know very few examples where it's had the kind of political impact that I know you and I would both like. Uh, and they were all talking about how things were better under Tito or under, or under Saddam. I mean, uh, it's hard to tie economic aid to political benefit. Thanks, Dan. Question in the front. Uh, microphone to the front. Hi, uh, Roy Gutman. I'm a journalist. Uh, Dan, uh, I didn't hear very much about Ukraine, and I'm not sure how your matrix applies uh, to it. Um, and the other thing I'm missing is uh, an explicit mention of uh, the importance of, of having a real constitution <coughs> that is upheld uh, with it. You mentioned the judiciary. Um, it seems to me that if you look even at Saudi Arabia, uh, and certainly in really every country in the, in, the, in the region, there's a drive by certainly the younger population and the educated older population, which is considerable in many of these countries, <coughs> for a modern state. And that this uh, is something that, that the dictatorships cannot deliver. They want to be part of the modern world. And there seems to, it seems to me there has to be some path uh, that uh, somebody carves out or somebody describes that, that will bring them to modernity. That's what it seems to me the Arab Spring was about. Thank you, Roy. Other questions? Hand in the back, young man in the back. Uh, Donald Kachapur, I'm with FHI 360, and I just had a question about, um, I guess, the involvement, the involvement of, uh, of an agreement of a peace agreement, for example, for Dayton. Um, when that was negotiated, was it expected that that would be, end up being the de facto constitution of the country? And then um, were you also, was it an expectation that the minorities, meaning especially a, a smaller minority like the Croats, would give up such exemplary power that they have on true equal footing? in order to move the country uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any last question? Uh, two last questions. Gentlemen in that row. And then here. Um, I, I like the list of bottom lines. Uh, sorry, Patrick Crump, uh, international development practitioner in the Middle East and uh, also the Caucasus. Um, I guess my question is, where does the people's sense of accountability for past atrocities, where does that fit in the and, and what, what, I remember some high-profile international court cases in the Balkans, but how were, how were the, you know, the accumulated atrocities or people's sense of grievances, how were they addressed and what, what would be your recommendation for these other conflicts? Thank you. Last question here in the front, I believe. Uh, Jameson Cunningham with a group called Americans for Free Syria. My question is related to Syria. It seems like, kind of looking at the bottom lines over here, so sort of the Assad family since the 60s kind of did the exact opposite of the recommendations that you mentioned. Um, so given, given all that and, and sort of where we are now, it, what could the international community have done throughout those decades to create leverage, push for those things that you're talking about, decentralization, better leadership, uh, conflict prevention, peace building, those types of things. And now moving forward, can you see any hope for any of this with the Assad regime in power? If not, what does that look like post-conflict? Thank you. So we'll have responses from Dan and then Renda. Any last comments? You also, if you would want to comment, and then we close. Sir. Uh, great questions. Uh, yes, modernization is the, the thing you find everybody wanting in the Middle East. And not only the Arab Spring demonstrators, but when you visit Doha and Riyadh, <coughs> All I want to talk to you about is who's more modern? Who's doing more to modernize? Uh, the sad fact is that uh, modernization is 
see much more concretely throughout the Middle East, I think, in infrastructure than it is in court systems. So you get this, this overwhelming emphasis on building skyscrapers and very little on building independent judiciaries, which are harder to build and take longer than skyscrapers. Uh, but I don't know a lot of, you know, there is, of course, a, a layer of Western educated people who are worried about independent judiciaries. But I've actually never heard uh, a Middle Eastern politician talk much about them. And they rarely, they rarely arise in the political discourse. Uh, I'm downplaying Ukraine at this session because we're at the Middle East Institute. I'm hoping to arrange something at USIP where we'll talk about Ukraine. Uh, and you can go there. <laughs> uh, on the Dayton Constitution, well, we went to Dayton thinking that the peace we were, were arranging was very unlikely to last. And when we finished there, we were really quite sure that it was unlikely to last. So we wrote a constitution. I didn't write it. Jim O'Brien wrote it. But we wrote a constitution that was very difficult to amend because we were convinced that if we gave them the opportunity to amend it, that the whole thing would fall apart. So it was intentional. Uh, a lot of people criticize it now, saying you should have provided for some sort of review Balance. mechanism. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is we didn't think it would last until a review mechanism if we allowed for one. So we didn't allow for one, and now mm. people are stuck with what they've got. Nevertheless, uh, my friend Jim O'Brien is a very bright guy. And he wrote into the Dayton Constitution the entire European Convention on Human Rights. And that's the reason why parts of that constitution have been challenged in court in Europe and have been declared inadmissible. The problem, of course, is that the political system in Bosnia won't change the constitution to conform to the court decision. So there's, a, there's still a big issue. Uh, this question. Uh, let me take the question of Croat power on that constitution. Croats are one of the constituent peoples in Bosnia. That means that they are a state-forming people, and they have veto power over anything that they judge to be important to them, even though they are probably, I think, the current figure is around 15% of the population, 14%. This is a problem wherever you make power sharing is profoundly anti-democratic. It empowers people beyond their numbers in the society. That's its purpose. Uh, so is that wise to do? I don't think it's wise to do in constitutions. I, I think constitutions are just too hard to change. And this has to be renegotiated because populations change, because political circumstances change. Now, it is true that in the Balkans, in Bosnia in particular, the high representative intervened at one point to, to change this a bit. Uh, but that's uh, turned out to be a very big political issue today. Uh, quarrels over renegotiating power sharing I find particularly unproductive and uh, is one of the reasons why I prefer not to see power sharing written into constitutions. Uh, Public. Accountability for past crimes. It has never had the positive impact we had hoped in the Balkans. Hmm. The truth of the matter is that all hundred odd war criminals in the Balkans have been arrested and sent to The Hague in what was really an extraordinary operation. I mean, it, it's just fantastic that they were all captured and it made a difference. Because had they remained in their home countries, it would have been a political factor that would have made things much more difficult. Try Milosevic in Belgrade. You go and try. Uh, 
That said, the trials themselves don't have a good impact because the war criminals, when they're condemned or treated as heroes in their own country, the defense is paid for lavishly by their home, by their home ethnic group. Uh, it's, the whole thing has not had the impact everybody had hoped. I think today people think that some kind of hybrid judicial system in which there are internationals mixed in with local judges uh, is a better way to go. We did that in Kosovo somewhat successfully so far. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me to be a, a good idea. I'm not an enthusiast for the uh, courts in The Hague because they haven't had a positive impact and because they're extraordinarily expensive. They really are. Uh, on Syria? On Syria. Uh, Assad has done the opposite of all of these things. That's right. Could we have done something to mitigate Assad? Uh, I'm sure we could have. A thousand things. Nobody cared to do it. He was more a partner than anything else. We were so grateful that Syria was taking refugees from Iraq that we weren't going to bend his arm about municipal governance in Syria, that's for sure. What can be done now? I've been thinking about this hard. I haven't written anything about Syria in, in the dog's age, because what are you going to say? It's, it's, it's dreadful. I think the best that can be done now is to carefully document what's being done in the post-war period. The Russians, the Iranians, the Syrians, the Turks are all going to be doing things. And it's going to be reconstruction, but it's going to be in their image, not in ours. And I think transparency about that is extraordinarily important now. And I see very, very little of it. There's very little good writing coming out about the situation inside regime controlled areas in Syria. And that's what really counts now. So I'd like to see more of that. Thank you, Dan. Brenda, do you have any last thoughts? No, no. I mean, okay. I Dan has exhausted Said it all. Well, this has been a fascinating, excellent session. Dan, congratulations on the book. Uh, thank you all for coming. Join me in thanking thank you all. Dan and Brenda. Thank you.